Good morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine, and I'm a first year MBA and master's in asset management student at Yale SOM. With great pleasure and honor, I would like to invite you to welcome our first panel of the day, Recent Trends in Impact Investing and ESG, Navigating the Explosive Growth. Please join me to welcome our distinguished moderator and guest speakers, Ms. Rebecca Lilly, Investing with, Direct with Impact Director, Family Wealth Director, and U.S. Government Entity Specialist at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management. <laughs> Ms. Joy Fekas, Head of Sustainable Investing and Corporate Responsibility at Raymond James Investment Management. Mr. Patrick Briel, Head of Impact Investing at Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. <laughs> Ms. Amy Bevelacroix, Managing Partner at Green Street Impact Partners. <laughs> and Mr. Peter Gruner, Principal at the Bridge Bank Group. <laughs> Welcome everyone, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> yep, good, okay. Um, uh, we are all delighted to be here today. Uh, we had a lot of fun putting this panel together with the help of Jasmine. And really, since we're the first panel, we could take this conference in lots of different directions. Um, so we feel very privileged to have that opportunity. Um, but we're gonna, we actually don't have a whole lot of time and there's a tremendous amount of ground to cover. So I was just going to, um, you know, just as a little bit, you know, all of us are, are deep practitioners of uh, impact investing and sustainable investing. We all are literally implementing it every single day in our line of work. And so um, the, all the theoretics and, and um, you know, um, uh, possibilities of ESG is wonderful, what the students in the room are learning in class, but come to each of us, we are literally on the ground trying to implement it and get it done every day. So um, with, without further ado, I'll just kind of start and ask the first question. I'm gonna ask general questions. Each panelist is welcome to take it in the direction that they wanna take it. As you see, we have a very um, wide spread of um, interests and talents and, and, and professional expertise on this panel. And then in the end, we're gonna open it to questions. So. Um, start thinking about what, what tough questions you can ask us. So um, to just start, we have all come here today from very different segments of the industry. Um, we all, and so we all have a very different lens of what we do practicality on the day-to-day -day basis as well as what we're talking to our clients about. But I'd love for all of you to talk about um, you know, what, what your line of work is and maybe where you are seeing uh, the best case for impact investing in each of your respective professions. Go ahead. Okay, I guess I'll start. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for being here, and thank you uh, for having uh, me on this panel with these wonderful people. So uh, what do I do every day? Um, well, as head of sustainable investing and corporate responsibility at Raymond James Investment Management, it's about working with our investment teams across all of our affiliates working with them to incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors into their investment practices. We are primarily fundamental analysts at heart, so it really is part of the fundamental uh, analysis that goes into that investment decision. Other components include active ownership through proxy voting and corporate engagement, again, working with all of the investment teams uh, to engage their investee companies. Again, these are publicly traded entities, um, and so both in the fixed income and equity space. So it really runs the gamut in the traditional uh, ESG incorporation uh, across investment uh, practices. I will also hasten to say that we do not do, um, pri we're not primarily focused on ESG focused investing. Uh, it is part of the traditional mainstream investing analysis, if you will. Uh, while we do have uh, some teams that do focus on it, uh, for the most part, it is how do we build in portfolios that incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors into the overall investment decision. Um, so 
that's uh, that's day to day, uh, and boy, it keeps me uh, keeps me kind of busy. So, thank you, Patrick. Um, I would probably say I do everything that Joy doesn't, um, <laughs> in the sense that we really represent charitable institutions. So think about your tr traditional private foundation. You've got your endowment that's trying to maximize returns, and you've got your program staff that's really trying to maximize impact. And so what we're trying to do is help asset owners jam those two things together. So from a strategic perspective, developing an, an integrated investment policy statement that represents both sides of the house and then operationalizing those two components very tactically on who looks at a deal when. How do you actually determine whether it has enough impact or enough return to be relevant for the different pots that you have? For private foundations, we talk about four different pots. You've got uh, the ESG uh, component, You've got the mission-related investment component, which is essentially trying to take just a really high-impact lens on the endowment. You then have program-related investments, which is an IRS-defined term where you can actually um, make investments to qualify for your 5% required payout per year. So those are kind of concessionary, high-impact investments. And then you've got your grant budget. So I'll, I'm up here representing the, the private foundations of the world. But a lot of the motivation uh, to Rebecca's question is integration and stewardship. So a private foundation says, look, we've been trying to do this 5% thing for a long time. What about this 95%? And how can we engage that to be integrated with our mission? And even in certain cases, you have um, foundations that have realized, my gosh, we care about climate change on our grant making, but we're invested in all these fossil fuels because there's this, there's this wall between the, the endowment office and the program staff. So let's integrate the thing and do our best to, to build those two things together. Hi, everyone. Um, Amy Bevilacqua, and I represent the private equity um, piece of this puzzle. And I run uh, a firm that makes impact investments in the future of education and the future of work. And where we sit on the capital stack is growth equity, which is a bit of a wide band. So it's different from venture or early stage investment where often the investment is made in a concept or a highly charismatic entrepreneur. It's very different from buyout on the other end of the spectrum where often the bet is around financial engineering and, and turnaround. We invest in companies that have a minimum of five to 10 million in revenue and are profitable or nearly profitable. Uh, and we invest ultimately in growth plans so that's, that's what I do. Um, and we have a sector-specific focus. So I mentioned education and where education meets economic mobility. And that's what I mean by the, the future of work. And you know, in response to the question of what is the case for impact investment, it's really simple in education, and I think in other fields, that impact drives alpha. So in education, if you're seeking out companies that have an opportunity to scale, it turns out you can't scale in education unless you have a demonstrable track record of positive learner and worker outcomes. I think that same thing is true in a lot of other fields like healthcare and climate. So by that definition, perhaps everyone is by default an impact investor when you're investing in some of these sectors undergoing such rapid change. But to me, that's the case for impact. It's great to be here. Thanks uh, for having me. At, at Bridgespan, we are advisors to social change makers. And historically, that's been advisors to philanthropists, foundations, and nonprofits. But over the course of the last 10 years or so, as impact investing has matured, grown up, we've seen a bit of a gap in the market, an opportunity for us to leverage our impact expertise and kind of comfort with uh, the, the role of business drawing from our, our, Bain, our Bain roots. And so we've been doing that increasingly over the last few years. What we do right now is work mostly in private markets. Uh, we do fund strategy, impact underwriting, and impact value creation. We expect that mix will change over time, uh, particularly as fund strategy impact frameworks get a little bit more commonplace and that capability is built up around the sector not a need for Bridgeband to come in and help you with that. We can focus on newer areas like impact value creation where we see a, a huge opportunity. The, the folks we work with are primarily 
um, private equity type players, large asset owners like pension funds. And we would love to work with more family offices and endowments. I, I'm, I'm really excited to hear the kind of impact first language coming up. It's, it's, it's just a huge opportunity, not enough happening there. And we would love to see more innovation, more concessionary returns, uh, more innovative impact investments happening there. And that's a, that's a portion of our business that we expect will, will grow over time. So excited to kind of draw on the private market side and share a little bit more over the course of the panel. So you can see that there's quite a bit of diversity on this panel. Um, we heard about alpha. We also heard about concessionary. We heard about private markets. We heard about public markets. We heard about philanthropic efforts. And so the intersection between all of this is, um, can be a really big melting pot um, in terms of the field. Um, that leads to a lot of opportunities. I think all of us are very opportunity focused. But it can also lead to um, you know, misperceptions, misconceptions within the field. Um, certainly, I think everyone in this room knows that there's some challenges going on with even some of the, the basic definitions, ESG, what exactly is that, what is it not, um, impact investing, what have you. So um, I guess that would be kind of the next question is each of you in your um, own respective fields, um, what are the challenges that you see? How are you addressing those challenges? Um, you know, what are you talking to your clients about in terms of all that? Um, well, you know, again, it's, it's no surprise. <laughs> you've, you've alluded to some of those challenges. Um, and so it really is just being clear, again, from our perspective as um, asset managers in public markets, it's how are we incorporating these, these issues into the investment decision? So challenges include, um, you know, things like, um, you know, fiduciary duty. Are you doing, you know, what you, what you say you are doing in the best interest of your investors? Another challenge is quality of data. We're hoping um, that that's going to be improving going forward. Uh, there is that myth that if you are uh, incorporating these factors into your investment process, you're giving things up. Um, you know, again, looking at it in the public market sphere. Um, and so it's really just, just being very clear about what you're do, what you're doing, how you're doing it. Uh, a lot of times what's helpful is framing it in that risk management lens that it's part of holistic, uh, you know, and comprehensive analysis that goes into investment decision making. So uh, again, it's identifying you know, those issues, uh, being clear about how you're, you're doing it, but recognizing that we are in an environment where data is limited, you know, public data is limited. Uh, and hopefully we'll see those things uh, you know, straighten out with the SEC's uh, proposed uh, rule changes, um, but we'll see. Uh, a word that you'll hear a lot, I think, from all of us and throughout the day is this concept of a journey. Uh, hard things uh, are hard, and they do take time. So that's the other challenge. It's like, show it to me now. You know, how is this, how is this going to, to impact? How is this going to help my portfolio? Blah, blah, blah. It takes time. It's a journey, and we all have to do it together. So I would say from the public market perspective, that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of challenges. Uh, for me, maybe to be a little, a little cheeky, um, the biggest challenge or misconception is that you have a choice to do this or not. Um, one, of them, one of the big reasons for that is essentially one in every three investment dollar is being integrated with some sort of value, mission, um, impact consideration. If you look at the chart of any market sizing over the last 10 years, it's almost exponential. So getting into this field or having an interest in it, it's already happening, it's already here. So you need to pay attention to it. The other thing is, and this is the biggest kind of worldview shift for me in this, in this whole consideration is that every investment you make has inherent impact in it. It's not a matter of going and finding the impact investment. Any company you invest in, whether it's in your target date 401k or some fancy direct equity investment, every company has a supply chain. They have a board. They're creating products and services. They are doing things out in the world that make a difference and have an impact on all sorts of things. So the idea is get to know what, that, what your portfolio is doing. 
get to know what your underlying you know, positions are and try to slowly shift that towards the net positive. Um, that's a challenging thing to do, to you know, even get to know where your, what your exposure is. But that framing, reframing for me and, and for a lot of the folks we work with is really helpful to say there's no choice that we have to make. It's just about owning what we own and trying to shift uh, towards the net positive. So uh, if anybody is familiar with Anthony Bug Levine, he's a really important thinker and practitioner in this field. And he really coined this term and this idea of additionality. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big challenge. The question is, what difference did it make that we brought our capital to bear? So what is it that would not have happened if we hadn't have made this investment? There's a certain level of amplification of impact that happens over the passage of time with the maturation of a company. What difference did we make? I think our response to this challenge is all about transparency. So for example, in education and in any industry where the pace of change is really rapid, there are lots of factors at work. So you have to be uh, radically candid um, with yourself, first of all, as a firm about what difference can we make, even in the early stages of evaluating an investment? What is it that we can do to move the impact needle? You need to be really open with the companies where you're deploying capital about what you can do besides sit on a board. As productive, as engaged as you might be, what can you do beyond that? And then finally, and most importantly, we need to, and we owe transparency to our LPs, uh, to our investors. So the challenge is additionality. I think the response is all around uh, transparency. So there's, there's definitely a number of challenges. I, I think it, it's worth like stepping back very quickly, though, and just saying like the opportunities and like successes over the last few years are dramatically more significant than the challenges. If we had this conference three years ago, we probably would have been talking about like the IMP impact framework, some like really core stuff that just is taken for granted in the market now. So I think it's helpful to kind of step back, take credit for the progress, and be excited about the future. That said, there are challenges. Um, for our clients, the challenges we're seeing, first and foremost, are fundraising in the macro environment is quite challenging. That's not unique to impact, not something they can control, um, but that is certainly a challenge, particularly for what we would say are like impact native fund managers, so fund managers who are a little bit newer, younger, don't have the track record. Those are the ones that find it most challenging to get the capital. It's a little bit easier if you have an anchored funder who can do the diligence and, and make the connections. Not enough of that is happening for those folks, though. Um, two, I think, is, is this public debate around ESG that's happening? I think it's a bit of a, a red herring sideshow. It's not impacting the actual decisions our clients are making, but they're, they're, they're having to spend a lot of their time talking about it with folks, answering questions and emails from clients about it. Ultimately, it's a pretty US-centric thing, and this is global, and so uh, like it, it, I don't think it will, it will slow it down at all. And if you look back historically at like, all of the major changes in financial markets, there's always been this argument of like, there, this is too much, too hard, it's gonna put too, too much increased cost on companies, and even things like gap accounting principles, we were having this debate. So I think we'll have the debate move forward, and essentially what we're seeing our clients do is talk a little bit less about it publicly, but not change their underlying investment strategy, particularly long-term investors like pension funds that don't have to think too much about short-termism and, and just like if they're not thinking about some of these climate risks, um, they would be going against their fiduciary responsibility. So um, that's what we're seeing on the, on the debate. The other big one I'll, I'll name, and we can talk a little bit about it, is just the regulations that are coming down. Uh, there's a lot of excitement and confusion about what they are, how to adhere to them. And I think what we're seeing largely right now are folks spending a lot of time trying to figure out in a room with lawyers what they need to report on. And that is good. It's helping us get clear about where there's greenwashing, where there's not. And ultimately, it's a step in the right direction. It's taking up a lot of money, resources, time that we think could be spent more authentically pursuing impact opportunities. And so, so we haven't gotten the balance quite right, and a lot of really smart people are really trying to figure this out. And so I think over the next six, 12 months, as we start to report on these KPIs and, and, and see what folks are, are doing, we'll get some more clarity. But it's just taking up a lot of, a lot of energy in the sector right now trying to, trying to figure that out, even though 
it's for sure a step in the right direction, and we're excited about it, and it's really critical. Thank you all. And I, so, I mean, if the first question really showed the diversity of um, the different uh, parts of the field, the second question really shows that we are a, a field in flux, and in flux on several different um, areas. And so, you know, uh, at Morgan Stanley, we have been um, providing um, uh, portfolios to clients that achieve some type of intentional impact for over 10 years. And the firm has um, attracted over $70 billion uh, in 10 years towards the, that type of intentionality within a portfolio. So that's a tremendous amount of, of adoption, and we're hoping to hit a $100 billion uh, point uh, in the next few years. And then every year, Morgan Stanley does an institutional survey. So these are surveys to pensions, foundations, and endowments. $50 million and up about their, uh, about their use. Um, it, it's not specifically about impact investing, but more generally kind of trends that they see. But 85% uh, of asset managers have shown that they are very, very interested in, in this area, impact investing. 83% of asset owners ha are very, very interested. And 77% of people who are uh, and part of the survey, I say that they have increased interest as opposed to just two years back. Um, this data is from 2021. Uh, and then we, do, we also do surveys of um, uh, private clients. And when you take a look at millennials, you know, that's pretty close to 99%. Mm -hmm. So there's incredible adoption. We've heard about all the, the, the challenges that there are with, the, with a, a field in flux. So my next you know, question to all of you, and Peter, we'll start with you just to mix it up a little bit, would be, you know, what are you, you talked about the next six months or so of what you're looking forward to, but what are you looking forward to maybe over the next three years, five years? What are you most excited about? Where do you see um, there'll be a lot of change? And... Yeah, um, well, a, a few things we're excited for. One is hopefully more investment dollars and rigor going to social investments. There's a whole lot going to climate. There's, it's much easier to report on. In an uncertain regulatory environment, you can report on GHG, it's pretty clear. So we're seeing a lot of dollars go there and it's crowding out some of the investment in social. So we, we wanna see more there and we wanna see folks getting a little bit more rigorous there. Um, the second thing I would say is we, we really wanna see more um, standardization on the KPIs that firms are reporting. This will allow funds to benchmark themselves against others. And what we hope that will help do is create this flywheel of competing against impact. And so right now, uh, the market is competing on financial returns, and you just have to take the investor at its word about the impact that they're creating. We would love to create some opportunity for investors to really credibly understand how the fund manager is doing on impact and start to allocate their dollars based on that. If we're able to do that, we think it will, it will create the competitive pressure for folks to really be best in class. Um, this, the final one I'll, I'll, I'll say is um, there's this pool of capital that you would think should be doing impact investing and just isn't doing a ton right now. Endowments, family offices, um, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to see private equity funds being the ones that are, are first out setting up these impact funds that are backed by the frameworks and places like universities mm -hmm. and family offices being a little bit slower to adopt. And so we would love to see that change. It's, I think, a little bit of just the professionalization of the family offices and endowments. They now functionally act as if they're a, a venture capital or private equity fund uh, or a complex financial institution. And so they don't take those really big risks that we saw um, before that professionalization. And we're seeing a little bit of this happening now. Um, Nathan Cummins Foundation is one that, that is referenced. Ford Foundation is being really public about this. Um, and we're seeing some fam family offices do some, some creative, innovative stuff. But we would love to see more of that impact first capital. We think that's the missing link. And some really exciting opportunities there. And we're hoping folks will, will step up and, and lead there. What I'm excited about um, is getting more women and people of color mm. in positions leading impact funds. Um, and there are a lot of signs of, of light there. There are some systemic programmatic approaches across the sector to really help create uh, better success rates for 
emerging fund managers um, of all types. Um, the NAIC, for example, has a great program called NextGen. Um, I just transitioned into investing after spending 30 years plus as an operator. And so I went through that program because I am actually an emerging fund manager. And it's, it's in that programmatic uh, support that I think we're going to find more women and people of color um, coming to the fore, becoming visible in impact investing, but of course in, in asset management in general. And I see, uh, I see lots of points of optimism along those lines. And it's, it's not just about representation, it's about asking yourself, what does it take to make good investment decisions? And one of the most important things you can do is have diverse perspectives around the table. Mm -hmm. well, I was going to say something different, but now I think I'm going to follow yours. <laughs> You're just a big plus one. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> plus one from the other side of the table in the sense that uh, sometimes I talk about myself as a recovering white male. Um, 98% of investment decisions by some metrics, it's a little bit dated, the, the data, are made or governed by white men. And so how can we actually democratize the flow of funds and it be, have more representation and inclusivity in the, in the investment uh, making uh, process? And so there's a, a, a ton of movements. Um, we're trying to kind of collect all the different resources because there's a ton of them now uh, to support um, founders and fund managers of color uh, women uh, founders and fund managers. And the idea is how can we, in three, five years, the, the flow of capital is representative at least of um, who's managing these dollars. Uh, so that's the, that's the big shift. The other one that I was going to mention, and similar to, to Peter's comment, is I guess over time you've had, you know, impact investing is not new. In some ways it's, it's uh, you know, thousands of years old with, with kind of religiously motivated negative screens. Mm -hmm the first introduction into the tax code, 1969, and then it's kind of slowly grown. And then what, for, for whatever reason, 2012, you look at the charts and it's just like totally different. Um, we see that driven by um, you know, the role of women and um, the next gen and decision making uh, related to investments. But now we're kind of hitting like, okay, we've arrived and we're now starting to get some significant pushback. Um, it's become politicized as you've likely seen. So what I'm excited about is kind of getting over this hump and really proving the model and, and having the first really big test of the of this space. Um, some things that I don't think folks realize sometimes when they're new to ESG and happy to defer, but there's no clear definitions on the E, the S, or the G. You get to choose what these what those definitions are. It's not dissimilar from grant making at the end of the day. Like, this is impact to me, so I'm going to tell you what it is. Of course, there's more and more standards, more um, more push to consolidate and standardize, but there's no clear definitions of that. And I think um, seeing that, at, le at least a little more standardization, so there's some, um, some verification that this is actually true uh, thoughtful impact on anything that has the, the ESG stamp. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm going to be a little radical here and say in the next three to five years, I'd really love to see this term ESG go away. Wow. You're here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> We're going to fight. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Hear me out. Hear me out. I'm actually going to build on something Great. that you that you said Great. at your Great. opening, which was this is already part of the system. Anything you're investing in has impact. Any Any company, whether it's impact on its employees, the communities in which it operates, its supply chain management, energy that it uses, there is impact in what each of us does every single day. And so what I'd like to see is, this is just part of the investment process. Mm -hmm. This is just part of the work we have to do to understand fully and comprehensively a company, an opportunity, a project, a program. What is it doing? How many people, how many communities does it affect? So I think we've actually done ourselves Selves a disservice by having this ESG moniker out there and just say, you know, this is, this is just what companies do and where you place your money amplifies that. Mm -hmm. And so it's just being very conscientious about that process. Um, so for three to five years, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. 
fighting. I don't know if that's still that's fighting great. words. No, 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 but... no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> that's even better. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think we've got a lot to look forward to. I think it's going to be really exciting to see. And I've got the gray hair to prove it. I've been in this field of sustainable investing since 2009. I actually come from a traditional investment background uh, in credit where I would be looking at these things anyway. My teams would be looking at these things. And then all of a sudden, it has this name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I think, what we're getting hung up on, is this ESG name. So the faster we can say it's part of good investing, it's part of our thought process, it's part of our environment, mm -hmm. I think that's my thought for the next three to five years. Well, and I think that that's a very public markets type of, of view because, again, <laughs> uh, most of my work in constructing portfolios for both private clients and um, institutions, uh, pensions, foundations, and endowments is in the public space. And certainly about five years ago, um, as ESG was getting all this traction, and I believe it was actually here at the Yale Impact Investing, the lead speaker from, I think it was um, maybe 2019 or something, Feli can correct me, but he, you know, there was a big debate in the academic world about the value or non-value of ESG, and and back then they really said, well, we really think in about five years' time ESG won't even be a term anymore because it'll just be what everyone does. Well, it clearly is still um, a term. It's a term that is has a lot of contention around it, but on the private ESG is a little bit different. ESG is mostly about security selection. Um, and certainly you are doing that to drive company adoptions of better practices and to make impact. But it's very different in the, in the private markets. Um, and so I don't know if you, if, if, you, know, um, you three have any other kind of um, temperament on that. You know, we think that in five years' time, uh, everyone will just be doing it, so it'll just be commonplace, but you probably have, I think impact will maybe be even more uh, important mm -hmm. in five mm -hmm. years' time. Yeah. We, we, we can't ignore it, right? We see them as different, and, and I do think the confusion about what terms mean and everyone kind of defining it separately does make it a little bit harder. So we see like ESG data, ESG investing, and impact investing as like three terms that are used interchangeably. They're quite different. The ESG data is just like non-GAAP data that's material to the business. The folks who were arguing against the backlash in, in Texas, they were, they were insurers. They weren't like NGOs. These were, these were business people who said, this is just data that is not on the balance sheet that we use to make decisions. Like we need to be able to do this in order to do our jobs, right? Like wh what's going on? ESG investing, I think, is using that data to make a decision about investing. And then impact is, I think, identifying right now is like a product or service that in and of itself creates impact. But we would expect that actually to evolve over time to include things like um, ESOPs and wealth creation opportunities, like structuring your investment in a way that creates wealth for folks who otherwise wouldn't have gotten it. And, um, slightly different than ESG, but the confusion really makes it makes it tough, um, even even for really sophisticated investors. Mm -hmm. Amy, Patrick, any other um, words on kind of you know as you see impact increasing, the need for impact increasing, the need to, for funding impact increasing mm -hmm. versus maybe in public markets mm -hmm. it's just kind of it's just what we do. I mean, there isn't a lot that I'd want impact investing to inherit from ESG at this point. <laughs> Um, except um, the focus on data and the uh, reliance on some form of framework. Um, and I think that you know organizations like Impact Capital Managers, and you'll hear from Marika um, later today, are really working hard at advancing some standardization around um, those frameworks, which again is a really important vehicle for transparency. So I'd love for impact investing, and I think impact investing as a field will advance, by virtue of inheriting some of that obligation around data and frameworks. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I can give you the last word before we open it for Q&A. Wow, no pressure. <laughs> um, I guess I'll just go to what's currently on my mind. Uh, yesterday morning, we were at the, the kind of papering stage of a direct equity investment in an ed tech company. It's actually a convertible note between series A and B. And we actually have the, the, the $2 billion foundation legal counsel and external counsel, and then we've got the company and their counsel, and we're actually trying to talk about 
what's accountability for metrics. Mm -hmm. And um, so maybe this is just a message to, to founders and those that want to get in kind of the social enterprise space is have a real strong um, understanding of what you're trying to do and how you're going to respond to the big kind of market rate VC um, and then maybe the, the kind of high impact really focused on that, um, that additionality from an impact perspective because the company is really wrestling with if I commit to these things for this foundation, how will it affect these other investors, whether it's a fund or you know, any other investor? And so having a clear identity of who you are and how you're going to respond to those two things, because I think even founders are getting pulled in different directions from, from private markets. So with that, is there, can we, we can open it to the floor? You have my sunglasses. On. I was going to say we answered all their questions. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been one over here. Yeah, go ahead. Morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this panel. I'm a call Jean Louis Swai, and I'm a social entrepreneur. And I'd love to get your thoughts around that tension, mm. particularly for early stage companies, where you do need to sort of de-risk and prove out some of these metrics, and you're still sort of struggling with the larger capital markets wanting to define impact investing almost as charity. Thank you very much. Um, and I, mean, I, I looked to Amy because we had a conversation about this exact yeah. dilemma yeah. in preparing for this panel. It's hard, and I, I don't know if I have answers for you, but I can say, you know, as a, as a relatively new fund and a fund that is right now actively fundraising, um, we ask ourselves, and you might connect with this, um, are we narrowing our universe of LPs by even having impact in our name? Mm -hmm. um, I worry about that a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, for you, especially in the early stages of a company, I think you, you shouldn't be afraid to take an incremental approach. Um, so many of the most potent impact metrics are inherently longitudinal in nature. They don't lend themselves well to quarterly reporting mm -hmm. or annual reporting and sometimes biannual reporting. So I think that um, you, should, you should expect to find a lot of um, support on the capital side, on the side of investors, if you kind of say this is, this is what's doable right now. This is the impact that we can have, meaning these are the folks that we serve. Often it starts with, these are the folks that we serve, and this is the scale with which we serve them. It can be that simple. So maybe that's the, the innermost concentric circle, um, you know, against a long game of developing out a, an impact framework for your company. Anyone else, Peter, do you wanna? No, I think that captures it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say mm -hmm. that know your audience, Right, so know who you're speaking with. And if you are speaking with people who are impact first, absolutely be, you know, highlight that. Um, if you are speaking with people that really just want a good solid business model, um, then speak to that and uh, the impact will come in second. But I, I don't do this on an everyday basis. Like, <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, like, I, that's where my mind goes, which is like, take a look at some of the published impact frameworks from investors you might be targeting and try to communicate your investment in a way that makes it as easy as possible for them to see how you fit into that theme, thesis, and impact framework. It's, so there's a little bit of homework there to, to tell that story and just lower the barrier. And, um, I think that, that we don't say, I don't think a lot of um, founders are doing that just yet, um, so that could help you stand out. And after arguing for data, I'm gonna now argue the other side of it. Take a look at impact reports released by VC and PE funds. They're overwhelmingly anecdotal. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly. Yeah. So it's kind of a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> you can also kind of reverse engineer it a bit where you, um, there's a lot of movements for first time fund managers towards the, the recovering white male theme. Um, Due diligence 2.0 is one of them. So there's, we're trying to get folks to shift their the traditional ways of assessing whether a, a 
fund or a founder actually makes it into the first screen. So like alternatives to track record or um, ways to be more friendly to BIPOC and, and women-led funds and, and founders. So what I like to say is look at the principles, share those with potential investors. That's one thing. So that you're almost like an educator as well as you know, pursuing funds. And then look at the list of signatories and ask them for money because they're obviously, they're, they're inherently aligned. So there's a lot of movements on kind of mm -hmm. the racial equity and gender equity lens. Mm -hmm. There's another, yep. Hi, good morning. I'm Christopher Mondu. I'm a uh, MBA for executives candidate incoming this summer with the area of focus in sustainability. Um, in the opening remarks, we heard about a investment that was made in schools in India. And so I'm thinking through this perhaps as an Achilles heel from the last 20 minutes about um, US centric. I'm curious from the panelists perspective how you've seen uh, global interest in your respective fields for ESG investing either through clean energy or other um, areas that are pretty prominently um, in the media today. I'll, I mean, I'll just, I'll take the easy one and that is, um, you know, all the conversations about ESG in America, I think, is just folly for the whole rest of the world right now. So, once again, we look like we um, like we're infighting on um, something that just makes a lot of sense doing. And so, um, and I think at, at some point, I mean, the rest of the world, they're not changing their approach to impact and to ESG and to further. It, <coughs> One positive, one positive thing about the United States is that the companies have been um, incredibly responsive. I mean, if you look even at like, um, I don't know if it's the Russell 3000 or S&P 500 at the, at the index level. So, you know, average, you know, uh, across all the companies within the index, the adoption of ESG is, you know, north of, you know, 70%, depending on the E or the, or the S or the G. And so that is kind of a positivity for the U.S. markets. There is a tremendous amount of reporting that's out there. Companies have been very responsive. Um, I just had, you know, even companies that you don't think are responsive, they have to be responsive because they're looking to, um, for capital. Um, but I think the whole rest of the world is, is really kind of being the balance right now and that they are more tried and true. They're not going to be jerked around by, um, you know, Political games or what have you, and they're gonna they're gonna keep moving, moving it forward in a nice, steady, thoughtful way that um, maybe we're a little less adept, adept to. I, I'm very happy here about you all perspective. Well, well I mean, uh, you know that you're you're spot on with that one. Uh, the other thing that I will say is that you Europe in particular is farther ahead than we are in these discussions, and actually their regulatory environment. Uh, is in flux as well because they want to put more uh, definition around things. What is a sustainable investment using the EU taxonomy? Um, you know, what is a, you know, they've got these articles out there in Article 9. It's like a dark green sustainable investing vehicle. You've got Article 8 where you, you know, promote ESG factors. But they are in the process of raising that bar. So I think, you know, in at least Europe, they're farther ahead uh, and in certain parts of Asia as well. So, you know, I think it is moving globally, just at very differ different rates. And so I think that's one of the things that, that makes this interesting right now. Maybe anecdotally as well, uh, we published in 2020 the Impact Investing Handbook. It's like a 180-page book of how do you do this as an asset owner, um, and it's open sourced. But the first language we translated into from demand was to Chinese because um, there's a ton of asset owners that are interested in like, what is this thing going on uh, and how can we borrow from it? Of course, very different uh, environment there. Interesting you mentioned India because I think the UN has just you know, published this report that India is now outpacing China on total population. Mm -hmm. But both countries are very tricky related to kind of any impact or charitable activities in countries. So we've actually seen a pullback from at least you know U.S. investments uh, to because of the challenges of the the relatively new regulatory environment there, um, and then the the second um, way that we're translating this handbook is into is in partnership with the Chilean university into Spanish, and so there really is a lot of I think conferences um, and and activity that's happening 
well beyond uh, the US um, and seeing the same kind of trends, obviously following a little bit um, a few years behind. Yeah, just underscore that. Our Singapore office is seeing more inbound requests than, than US. But I would say kind of the North American um, investors are investing globally. So even if they're like a US investor, typically they have offices around the world. So it's, it, it's truly global. Uh, I do think Europe, uh, it's important to, to like know that Europe's setting the standard. It's not just for Europe. Folks are adhering to that today because if you raise money from European investors, you have to. And also, they suspect that other regs will follow pretty closely to that. Um, so even if it's not happening in the particular region, investors are looking to it with the expectation that the global economy will begin to align with some of those practices. So truly global, um, we're all kind of converging, it seems. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Michael McGuire. I teach entrepreneurship at Columbia University and also I'm a serial entrepreneur and raised a significant amount of money for the startups I've been involved with on um, this Questions really for Amy. Um, how are you pitching your LPs and what type of returns are you suggesting to them and how does that compare with funds with similar risks that aren't focusing on impact investing? Thank you. Yeah, so we um, have investment criteria of a 3x return across a five-year period. Um, usually before we get to that in the pitch, often in the second sentence, <laughs> We're explaining that our position as an impact fund is not about concessionary returns. So I, maybe if I go back to that question of where do we hope to be in three to five years, I hope to not have to say that anymore. Um, mm. But uh, that, is, that is how we pitch. So um, we, are, we are open about and, and kind of frontal about our being an impact investor, but we always have to quickly uh, caveat that. Um, and you do it by making the statement and making plain what your underwriting criteria looks like. And then people understand you're, you're targeting market returns. What I worry about, though, because we can have that conversation in a pitch, I worry about the doors that aren't open to us and the chances that we don't have to explain that because somebody sees impact in our names. So that's, that's not the... It's not for me, it's not the pocket of money I have. I'd like to take that question and kind of flip it a little bit because Peter, you know, um, talked about the growth of concessionary, you know, um, in terms of achieving impact. And of course, Patrick's in the, you know, philanthropic space. And so, you know, you were to take Amy, Joy, and Becky, and we are, you know, definitely proponents of alpha and big time returns. But you guys have a little bit perspective in how how you talk about that, how you want to talk about the growth of concessionary returns, and, and um, you know, again, the flip side of not having to say, we are not concessionary, we're looking for alpha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we just think it like there's uh, more than a trillion dollars sitting on balance sheets of philanthropies that are trying to do good, and 95% of that is not. So we just see it as a big opportunity. And, <laughs> and again, it's just, it, um, when, you're, when you're not a fiduciary, when you're, when you're a family office, you can make decisions that other investors can't. You can take risks because you believe in it. You don't have to maximize your returns. You can just do it because it's your money. And there's just so few people in the market who have that level of flexibility. And we need more folks to step up and lead um, and, and really live into some of the ambitions they, they, they've talked about. Um, so yeah, we, we're excited and we think we'll get there. We think it's not an ambition gap. We think it's more like a capability uh, structure gap. So we, we see it's quite, quite closable and social finance and a few others have recently come out with some great reports about what some of those gaps are. And I think getting clear on that will help make that happen. And, and it's a big pot of money. Hmm. Uh, one way of framing philanthropy is that it is the risk capital of society, that it proves models for governments to take up. But if you look at the average foundation, they're the most risk-averse entities you have ever come across. And it's one of the things that frustrates me the most in the, the space that I'm in. Um, in terms of catalytic capital, you know, there's a role, the same thing. Like, can high-impact investments from foundations actually prove models? 
or de-risk other investments so that the three others on this, you know, up here can take it and run with it. Um, the best resource I've seen is the MacArthur Foundation in partnership with Tideline, uh, the five P's of catalytic capital. Um, how do you actually take a you know, subordinate position in some way, price, pledge, position, patience, and do something that can actually prove a model or combine with traditional capital to make it a little more palatable for them. So, and we see that all the time, especially with program-related investments, where you, by the IRS standards, you must prioritize impact over financial return. And a lot of creative ways to do something like you know, loan guarantees, where you're, you're bringing down an interest rate, or taking a longer position, or being you know, the, the first loss capital on something and helping bring in um, other dollars. It is a little bit in conflict with this idea that you don't have to uh, have any trade-offs with, and, and you shouldn't be subsidizing investments because there should be this inherent view. But I do think there's this, like, um, that's the goal, but this, there, there are some steps I think we need to take to get there. And then I would just kind of follow up on that is, um, you know, I think it's over the next 20 years, $40 trillion um, will change hands in, um, um, in the great wealth transfer from baby boomers on to the next. And the interest, as we said earlier, from millennials and younger generations um, is, you know, 100% aligned. And mm -hmm. so that would be, you know, um, both in terms of making money, achieving alpha, having, you know, a well-diversified, you know, growth-oriented portfolio, as well as perhaps on the concessionary side as well, or the philanthropic side. And so um, that I think will be really, you know, that'll be really interesting. We didn't really talk about that before and where mm -hmm. we see ourselves in five, 10 years, but that, you know, that, you know, 20 years, $40 trillion will definitely play into some of these trends. Mm -hmm. Joy, I don't know if you have any other. No, I yeah, couldn't agree nice. more. It's, it's really moving. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Hi, my name is Angelina. Whoa, this is so loud. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm a student at Columbia University, a graduate student, and I have a quick question. So in terms of transitioning more foundations and endowments into the impact investing space, are there other challenges such as tax cons uh, consequences like UBTI that's stopping people from doing that that you guys have seen? Yeah. Yeah, there's... Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions on the difference between using the endowment as a mission-related investment and program-related investment. Um, I wish I had the name of it. There's one of the best charts that I've ever seen. It just gives that diff different differentiator. What qualifies for the 5%? What, what's UBIT? What's you know, all the, the tricky things related to accounting? Because now you have to add things in different places on the 990, for example, the public tax return. So there's definitely some, uh, some education there. But I think it's a, the first step is like educating trustees on something like fiduciary duty. Like, not only is there no inherent trade-off, you're actually, do, you know, the, a foundation is one big impact investment. What else is it? It's trying to make money and it's trying to do good. So just, <laughs> you know, merge those things together. But it's tricky to, you know, for an investment committee member to, to understand, wait, our, I, we can't have our cake and eat it too. Or even a program person, we've, we've had a lot of education sessions for you know, heads of program committees on foundations, and they're like, wait, you're, are you gonna defund my beloved grantees? So those, those kind of things, it's just, there's an education gap that's gaining ground, because you've got great case studies now from big named foundations that have been doing this for now decades, and I think those, some of those things, plus, plus the good data, can be uh, really helpful. Mm -hmm. And just to, to state the obvious, like grant capital is the most uh, important capital. Like it, like it is much more rare than any other capital. It's much more valuable. And so there is a debate about whether or not end, endowments from foundations should do whatever they can to maximize the amount of grant dollars they can give out. And so like there, there actually is like an intellectual debate that's, that's been happening. But I think there's increasingly enough folks saying, you know, actually, we can get market rate and better align our investments. And so that's what Ford Foundation is doing. They're not doing concessionary returns there. They're trying to prove that they can make a market rate or better in investments that are aligned with what they're seeking to achieve. That's a step beyond what many aren't doing, which is like just not investing in things that we know are like actually bad and detrimental to the impact. And so, um, there, there's like that piece of it. And then I do think the concessionary returns is slightly different. And, and that, 
some opportunity for endowments through PRIs and stuff like that, for sure, mission-related investments. But, but for there, we see family offices as being kind of the lever that has a little bit more control to do that. You don't have to worry about um, the, the, the covenants of the, 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 the endowment or um, particular tax implications. It's kind of up to you. And so you have that level of flexibility to do that. Um, but, but for sure, opportunity in both to better align the investments with impact, we think. I was on a, uh, in a, on a conference a couple uh, weeks ago, um, of all four foundations and endowments, mission-related, um, mission-driven organizations, and I saw almost a knockdown, drag-out fight about what fiduciary meant. Mm -hmm. And one said, it's only about making money for the environment, and then the other one said, no, you can achieve both. And um, there's still, so that's like another one of those challenges. Yeah. It's a very simple term of what fiduciary is, but then like the, the, the radical differences on how you, how you define that. And I think probably every, every board, almost every board um, needs education, back to kind of Pat Patrick's point about you know, education. What are the standard definitions of even something as simple as fiduciary duty? Yeah. Um, because the you know the regulations is that there is for it allows for both. It allows for you to, you have to be fulfilling the mission um, of your organization. So um, with that, with all that, is there any last closing? I think we're at time. Thank you all Thanks very much. No, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So the next panel is on venture capital and impact investing. But before that, we can take a short 20 minutes break. You can leave your staff here, have a coffee, and we'll be back in 20 minutes. Thank you.